Today's episode of The Overwhelmed Brain is brought to you by Everlywell. Get 15% off an Everlywell at-home lab test by visiting everlywell.com forward slash brain. Enter the promo code BRAIN during checkout. Life presents the toughest challenges. Every day you are faced with decisions that test your ability to express who you really want to be in this world. We're told to keep saying affirmations and keep thinking positively, but what do you do when that stuff doesn't work? Welcome to The Overwhelmed Brain, where you'll learn to make decisions that are right for you so that you can create the life you want now. Welcome to the show. My name is Paul Coliani, and I'm here to help you increase your emotional intelligence so that you can avoid dysfunction, handle toxic situations with grace and ease, and show up as your authentic self. Everything I talk about on this show is my personal opinion and is meant for informational and educational purposes only. Always consult a medical or psychological professional before making any changes that could affect your physical or mental health. Well, I've got a show for you about polarity. And uh, what I mean by that is we often have a mental challenge in our lives. Something comes along in a challenging way that we have to get through in some way. We have to either deal with, be tolerant of, be resilient of, uh, resolve or avoid. And these mental challenges come our way. And um, we have to question what we want to do and how we're going to get through it and what it's going to take and uh, what resources that we might need. And when these challenges come our way, the questions that we ask ourselves will be important. And what I mean by that is, let's just say that you are holding on to anger about someone in your life. They did something that you don't like, that was against you, that betrayed you, that hurt you in some way. When you have this emotional trigger that you're holding on to, like I held on to anger for a long time, and I didn't know I was holding on to anger, first of all, uh, but I also didn't know that I was holding on to hate and other emotions as well. But I would hold on to it because I didn't want to show up in the world as this negative person. I wanted to present myself as a good person, a kind person, a friendly person, a charming person sometimes, and uh, just everything opposite than I was feeling inside. Not that I was only feeling negativity, but I wanted to show the world this other side of me so that they would like me so that they would invite me over and be friends with me or uh, go on a date with me. I wanted to show the world what I wanted them to see so that they would like the me that I presented and not the me that was actually inside. And I think, you know, a lot of us will go through this. We will carry around a version of ourselves inside that we won't show the world outside. And what do we do when we are faced with a challenge where what's going on inside of us gets expressed? And so, you know, I'm kind of convoluted right now, but what I'm trying to say is when you experience a mental challenge of some sort, what's inside of us usually comes out and what is outside of us that might take a little sidestep so that the inside of us can come out. Now, what does that mean? That means if you are a generally positive person on the outside, but you're holding on to hurt, anger, fear on the inside, then when you are presented with a surprise mental challenge, something negative, uh, what's on the inside will have a tendency to come out. And so this generally kind, happy, uh, easygoing person turns into an aggressive animal in the moment and that person comes out and then you're embarrassed or you don't, you didn't mean to say those things or hurt that person, but it was in there because you've been carrying it around a long time. So I'm not talking about everyone here. I'm just talking about whatever's inside of you has a tendency to come out 
usually during the moments that you can't control. And so those moments that you can't control are usually the times when you're pushed over the threshold. So somebody comes along and says something about your mother or whatever. They say something hurtful or painful or something that violates your values or your boundaries. And you get pushed over the edge and this inside, quote, monster comes out. So whatever's inside will come out eventually. It, it will come out during those moments. And so I believe we walk around with some very strong filters to show people ourselves that we want them to see. We filter out the stuff that we don't want them to see. I'm not saying this is abnormal. I'm not saying it's dysfunctional. Even now, you know, is my true 100% personality coming out? I don't know. I mean, this is who I am in general, but there's probably things I won't bring up or connect with at a wholly emotional level, because if I did, I might start crying or I might get angry. So I'm going to have to filter some of my emotional responses, my emotional state that's inside of me to show the world. So again, I'm I'm just trying to relate to anyone listening that might uh, think, well, am I just supposed to take these filters off? I think that's not what I really mean. Um, I think what I really mean is when you show up in the world, you have to be aware of what you're carrying because when you are surprised with a negative challenge of some sort, what that is will come out. This is why it's important to heal on the inside, work on what's going on on the inside, inside of you, so that when you are surprised with a negative challenge, that whatever's inside, when it comes out, it will be more productive. It will be healthier communication. It won't be from a highly defensive place normally. It would be from a highly honoring place, a self-honoring place. And so when you come up with this challenge against a challenge of some sort, then what ends up happening is that your true self that gets expressed typically unconsciously, typically out of your control, because you've been working on yourself for X number of days, months, or years, the person that comes out then is very much in alignment with who you are at the deepest level. And the reason that's important is because when you aren't able to control yourself in those moments when people push you over the edge that you will have the the most strength, the most mental strength, and you will have strength and vulnerability. And that's kind of what I'm talking about in this segment is when you run into a mental challenge, uh, the idea that you're going to be vulnerable, more vulnerable when somebody triggers you in some way, uh, that will bring out what's inside of you. And that is a vulnerable place because if you don't have full control over it, which most of us, a lot of us don't because it comes out and we're like, Oh crap, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I shouldn't have done that. When that comes out, if it's from a healed place, it's going to be very powerful, powerful in the space of it honors you at the deepest level. It is the most healthy, healed place that you are currently in and being in that space, what comes out of you is again, productive. It is uh, something you can work with instead of some sort of a reaction that you lost control of. And now it's out of your hands and now things are really going haywire because of what you said or did. I know I'm kind of skirting around uh, the main issue here, which is when you get angry, what comes out of you? When you get upset at someone, what comes out of you? When someone does something that you are triggered by, what comes out of you? And, uh, you know, you don't even have to think about it. When you have done the healing, when you have worked on yourself, when you realize what you're carrying around and you decide that you're going to tackle it once and for all, then what you're carrying around doesn't 
have to come out anymore because you have worked through it. So let's give a real world example here. When I was married, I carried around anger. I mean, this is with any relationship really, but when I was married, I came to, carried around anger toward my wife that I didn't overtly show her. I didn't want her to know that I was angry at her. She was doing things that weren't necessarily bad at all. She had her emotional eating issues and I had a problem with her emotional eating issues. And I was quite the jerk. I did not like it and I did not see it as a problem that she couldn't control. I saw it as a problem that she could control and why doesn't she just stop so that we can have a normal life together. That was my limited thinking back then. And I'm not proud of myself, but that's what I did. That's how I was. And I was very judgmental and I was very emotionally abusive toward her in silent ways. And the silent ways I'm talking about are the, the inner feelings, the inner thoughts, the inner emotions that I carried around with me that I did not show on the exterior. Now they came out in very subtle ways, very nonverbal ways. Because I wouldn't say, hey, I'm angry when you do that and this is why. I would just give her the glare. I would just give her those bad looks. I would um, tell her to eat something else or let's go out and get some health food. I was trying to control her in very subtle ways. I was trying to control her in ways that um, didn't appear like I was trying to control her, which is emotionally abusive. It's just the bottom line. Uh, So I carried around anger when she didn't do what I wanted her to do. And that anger came out in passive aggressiveness. Uh, Like I said, those glares when she would eat something I didn't like. Even when she was thinking about it or talking about it, I would give her the silent treatment. I would withhold love and affection. And it was awful for her. She didn't want to go through that. And I shouldn't have put her through that, but I didn't know any better back then. I wasn't healed. And I didn't think I had to. So that narcissism kicked in too, the tendency to not want to work on yourself because you don't think there's anything wrong with yourself. That's totally narcissistic. I'm thankfully not NPD and I don't have the disorder, but that was a tendency that came in because I believed I was right. I believed that all the problems in the world were other people causing those problems for me. Not everyone, but usually the people that I was closest to. And so I had to try to control these people that I was close to. And when you do that, people end up not liking you anymore and falling out of love with you and don't want to be around you. Control will push people away. And so what I did was uh, during my marriage, I was, like I said, emotionally abusive and I held all this anger. And uh, then the day came, or several days came, where she started losing her passion for life. She started getting depressed. She wasn't looking for work anymore. She was sitting around a lot. And that didn't make me happy because now she was being, quote, lazy. And I saw this as a result of her own actions, not my influence or emotionally abusive behavior. I saw this as her making decisions that caused her to lose her passion, lose her energy. But what was happening is that she was slowly disintegrating inside because the person that she married that was supposed to love her and support her no matter what wasn't there for her and she felt unloved and unworthy. I can only see this clearly now because I've had to go through so much healing to get there. But if I hadn't, I wouldn't have realized it and I would have brought this dysfunction into the next relationship. But One day she decided to leave me. She decided to separate. And I've told the story on the show before, so I apologize if this is a repeat, but it goes along with what I'm talking about today. She left and it was with the intention that she would go find her passion again and we'd get back together. And so when she left, I was so happy. All right, she's going to go find her passion. She's taking action steps. I was really happy about that. And so a few weeks after she left, I had this epiphany because for the first time in years, I was able to sit with myself in my own thoughts, in my own head, and ask myself questions and reflect. I actually 
thought to myself what I could possibly do to improve our relationship. I don't know how those thoughts came about, but when you're by yourself, especially when you've been together for a long time and you really haven't had your own thoughts, all of your thoughts have been shared in some way or involved another person in some way, and they were never truly your own thoughts, you don't think the same way. You think with influence. And that person doesn't even have to be in your life at the moment. Like they could be at work all day, but you're still thinking about that person in your mind. Even though you could be making your own decisions to do your own thing, they're still in there somewhere. So when we separated and she was like a thousand miles away, suddenly I had my own thoughts. Tomorrow I'm going to wake up and she's not here. What am I going to do with my time? How am I going to spend my time? And so during that time, I started reading and I started learning and I started understanding myself. I did some meditation and I tried to figure out what about me was offensive or repulsive. I just decided to be vulnerable in myself and ask myself questions. If I were married to me, what would I not like? What would I hate? What would I want to change? And I asked myself those hard questions and had some realizations. And I pictured myself being my wife, looking at me and saying, wow, every time you go silent and you don't give me affection, I don't know where you are and I feel like you are abandoning me and I feel like you're rejecting me. I feel unlovable. You can do this when you have empathy. You can reach out through your emotions and connect with somebody where they are by seeing yourself through their eyes. And when you do this, that is the first step to healing is to see someone else that's going through something and asking yourself, how am I responsible for this? How am I involved in this? What role do I play in this? Because this will be very helpful because sometimes you don't think you're playing a part at all. Like there are people out there that they look at their spouse or their partner or their family or friend and they see a dysfunction that they don't like or they don't agree with and they think that dysfunction is that person's problem. And so they don't point the finger back at themselves and ask, okay, how do I play a role in this dysfunction? And that's important because if you take the opportunity to ask yourself and figure out how you play a role in someone else's dysfunction, you will find healing because there's an admission of vulnerability in there. There's an allowance of yourself to be part of the problem, which means you're also part of the solution. If you're part of the problem, you are part of the solution. doesn't mean you're going to resolve it, but you are a step toward a solution. And so when you ask yourself, what role do I play in this to have that dysfunction show itself? And a good example of that is something I've used before, something I've talked about before called secondary gain. Secondary gain is when there's a benefit to a behavior that seems dysfunctional. So you can have, let's just say a husband and a wife and the wife is really depressed and the husband's trying everything he can do to make her happy. He serves her breakfast. He brings her water when she needs it. He responds to her every whim because he really wants to make her happy. Guess what the secondary gain is in that? Her being depressed gets her husband's attention. Her being depressed gets her husband's love and devotion and constant servitude in a positive way because she sees this as a benefit. She sees this as something that she won't get if she's not depressed. And this could have developed by her not getting it before becoming depressed. And so there is that role that the husband is playing that is part of her depression. And I'm not calling depression a dysfunction. I'm just, I just thought of that example and I thought it was a good one. Her depression causes him to play a role to help her not be depressed 
But at the same time, if she stops being depressed, she loses this doting, or at least that's her thoughts or fears. And maybe she has tried getting better before, and she noticed her husband giving her less attention. And when her husband gives her less attention, she realizes, oh, that doesn't feel very good. I better go back to being depressed because that feels better because I'm getting the love that I'm looking for. And so that cycle continues and the husband might be getting drained and the woman, even though she is staying in depression, she's got the secondary gain going on and the secondary gain is very beneficial to her. So why stop? I'm, I'm simplifying it here. And again, I'm not trying to call depression a dysfunction. I've been there. I know what it's like, but that's a good example of how someone plays a role in something that maybe they think is someone else's doing or fault or problem. Just like I played a role in my wife's emotional eating because what happens to an emotional eater is that they eat when they feel an emotion that they don't want to handle. Again, I'm simplifying that too, but an emotion comes up for them and maybe it's anger, maybe it's sadness, maybe it's fear and they reach for something that makes them feel better something comfortable, something good. And so they eat it and there's a temporary high in the body, maybe some endorphins or some chemical shift, or maybe there's sugar and that makes them feel differently as well. Maybe there's caffeine like in chocolate. Who knows? There's all kinds of foods out there that will help someone feel a certain way. We all know what it feels like to eat something wonderful or comfortable. And, um, when it becomes dysfunctional or addictive, that's when uh, it can become a challenge. It can become a real challenge for the person going through it. So my role in that was making her feel bad for using food for comfort. If she feels bad, she uses food for comfort. I didn't figure that out for eight years. I caused her to feel bad, causing her to go back to her comfort, go back to what made her feel good, at least temporarily, which was comfort eating or food addiction. And so what I wanted her to stop was the very thing that caused her to continue. I'm not saying that I'm 100% responsible for it, but I'm saying I played a huge role for it continuing. And I know I did because... After we ended up getting a divorce, I saw how she was able to lose weight and eat better and eat healthier. And I was immediately struck and not angry. I was actually happy for her only because I had found healing inside of me. And I also realized, wow, you know, I had this thought, wow, I had been holding her back from something that she really wanted to do on her own, but because I made her feel bad, she couldn't, and she had no other coping mechanism. You know, this is my guess, my assumption. And when we got divorced, I wasn't a trigger in her life anymore. And taking me out of the equation removed the role I played and removed that variable from her challenge. And so when you see someone else with a challenge that they're going through and they can't seem to beat, you have to really assess your role and how you show up in their life and take responsibility for your role in how they're showing up in their life. Because you have to be part of the formula, part of the equation in order for you to experience the dysfunction that you don't want to see or experience in others. And if you understand that you're part of the equation, that's when it's important to dig into yourself and explore what needs to heal in you so that you stop showing up in a way that causes them to do behavior that they themselves probably don't want to do. Now, if we go back to that depression example, that might be a little different story. Like how would the husband in that example stop showing up for the wife when the wife really does need, it appears, really does need someone to be there to guide them, to help them, to serve them, to make them feel better. This is why it's important to find professional help. This is why it's important to have an open line of communication. 
Uh, this is why sometimes you'll find that people start to get angry at each other. Like the husband in that example could get burnt out and not come home early anymore and slow his response time to her needs, which causes her to become more depressed. And even though it may not necessarily be something that he's doing intentionally or hurtfully, in fact, he might have the best intentions, it's still part of the cause of whatever issue is going on. So understanding that helps you try to find a step toward the solution. So let me wrap this up with what I brought up in the beginning, which is what's inside comes out, which is why it's so important to work on yourself, heal yourself, figure out what you're carrying around, figure out what negativity is still lingering inside of you so that when you're in challenging situations, whatever's in there when it comes out is a healthier place to be. And I started telling you about the anger that I carried around toward my wife and of course other partners in my life because I have been judgmental for a long time and healing from that judgment involved me asking myself um, a couple of questions and I want to share those with you. The questions are this, let's just say that you're up against a mental challenge or an emotional trigger and you want to behave or say something and by doing that, it's going to exacerbate the situation. It's going to amplify the situation and it probably won't come out very good. Uh, for example, like my marriage, uh, one of the things I used to do was give her the silent treatment for a day or two. And that was me not only trying to process my anger, but also showing her that her behavior is unacceptable to me. And I kind of want to get her back by being silent, by withholding love. That's a huge dysfunction. It's definitely emotionally abusive, at least when you have that kind of intention. I'm going to withhold love to tell you that it's wrong to do what you're doing. So uh, I did that. And the question I started asking myself is, what am I gaining from this? Because we don't often dive into the results of any dysfunctional behavior that we have. But I wanted to ask myself that question because I would just do it thinking I was gaining something from it. But if I looked at the history, the pattern of myself doing that, I would find that I gained absolutely nothing. In fact, the only thing I gained was her feeling bad, her feeling guilty. And so I had to admit that what I gained was her guilt and her feeling bad. Do I really want that? Is that my goal? So I asked myself that question. What do I gain when I do that? And then I asked myself another question. What do I lose when I do that? And I started thinking about what I lost when I go into the silent mode. Well, I lost the happiness that I could have in these few days that I've decided to withdraw and decided to be angry. Uh, what else do I lose? I lose her laugh. I mean, there's part of the happiness too. I lose her smile. I lose her love. I lose myself because I feel like I'm not me anymore. I feel like I have to like get under a rock for a while. Where did I go? So I, I asked myself those two questions. What do I gain by doing this? And what do I lose by doing this? Then I asked myself the third question, which I've already covered, which is, if she did this to me, how would it feel? Which is the empathy question. If she did this to me, how would I feel? And so now what this does is it takes you out of the anger or the upset that you probably want to hold on to really tightly because you want to show them that you're angry or you want to make sure that you never forget what they did to you. And if you take yourself out of that mode by putting yourself in their shoes and you ask yourself, well, if that person did this to me, how would it feel? That takes you out of your own state and puts you in their state and helps you see it from a different perspective. You may still have anger about it. You may still have upset, but how does it feel? Because what you end up doing is role playing that person. You put yourself in their proverbial skin. You are them for this few moments. And any compassion or kindness or caring inside of them now has to come through you because you're playing them 
and you get to experience it. And you might realize something that you didn't realize before. When I put myself in her shoes and saw me through her eyes, I saw a very hurtful person. And I didn't like what I saw. And so this was the beginning of my healing is actually stepping into her shoes and asking myself those questions. And there's more, of course, if you've heard my episode on judgment or anytime I talked about the end of my marriage, I usually bring up the question I asked myself that went something like this. Um, if she never, ever changes, can I be okay with it? And that's a tough one because I spent my marriage waiting for her to change, wanting her to change, wanting her to do other behavior that I would accept, that I would be okay with. But if you take yourself out of waiting and put yourself against the wall, you know, paint yourself into a corner and just ask yourself that question. Okay, what if they never, ever changed? What if this is the person they were going to be for the rest of your life, for the rest of their life? Would you be okay with it? And when I asked myself that question about my wife, I said, no. And then I had to accept what that meant. I had to go through the mental process of what I would do next. Well, now that I know, because this is the next question, now that I know that she will never change, what am I going to do about it? And you know what that means? That means no matter how hard I try, no matter what I do, no matter what kind of control or manipulation or making her feel guilty or bad about herself, I do, it's not going to change her. Then the next step is not hers. It's mine. When you finally accept that that person will never change, you have to take the next step. You stop focusing on them. You stop waiting for them. You have to take the next step. That was an eye opener to fall into that line of thinking and tell myself that I have to take the next step. I've been so focused on her for the last eight years, taking the next step that should be her. But now that I know that she's never going to change, that falls on me. That means I have to take responsibility. That was the scary word for me. I have to take responsibility for the results that I want in my life for the relationship that I want in my life, all of these realizations came rushing at me. And I finally realized that I've been focused on the wrong person the entire time. Because when I asked myself that if she never changed ever, would I be okay with it? And I said, no, that brought up new thoughts that I'd never had before. And the next thought that came to me was, okay, knowing that she won't change, what do I do now? Does that mean I have to divorce her? Does that mean I have to leave her? And I thought, well, I, I guess so. And then I had to stop myself and say, wait, I don't want to leave her. I love her. I don't want to stop this marriage. I don't want to end what we have. There's so many other good qualities. And for the first time, I was able to focus on all those good qualities. Without the toxic thoughts and judgments that I had before, I was able to see the good stuff and focus on the good stuff and come to an acceptance of who she was and what her challenges were and also come to the acceptance that they were her challenges and it wasn't up to me to change her or fix her or do anything for me. It was up to me to support her where she was. This wasn't easy, but it needed to happen inside of me so that I could finally focus on myself. This was near the end of the marriage. This was a time when she already fell out of love with me. It was too late. And so what ended up happening is we did separate and we did divorce because she couldn't fall back in love with me. She, she locked her heart up. It was in a safe. It was not accessible anymore. And that was smart for her. That was very, very smart. And it was healing for me. It was hurtful as hell, but it was healing. And it needed to happen because it caused me to reflect on all the behaviors that I was doing. And so again, tying this into what's inside comes out of us, usually in destructive ways if we're not healed. The end of my marriage was when I finally started dealing and healing with what was going on inside 
and processing what was going on inside so that it didn't come out in destructive behavior and emotionally abusive behavior with my judgments, with my glares, with my silent treatments. All of that stuff disappeared because I finally took responsibility for what's going on inside of me instead of pointing at someone else saying, you need to change for me so that I can be happy. But that involved taking responsibility for my own result, taking responsibility for my next steps instead of looking at someone else to change their steps. That's the hardest part. And when we're in relationships and we know someone else is doing something that we don't like or they know it hurts us and they still do it, what are we doing for us to take responsibility for our situation and for our next steps? Because if we don't do anything, then we carry around what continues to enable behavior like this in our lives. And what I mean by that is that's why we end up in the same relationships over and over again. And that's how those relationships and how we are inside affects how the relationship turns out. If you're in a string of bad relationships, there's something you haven't healed inside of you. There's something that needs healing. There's something that wants to change. There's something that wants to heal. And we have to stop pointing the finger outside of us and saying that person is causing me all this pain. Because if you are still with that person, again, whether friend, family, or romantic, and you haven't done anything to help yourself and heal yourself and stop being part of the formula of the dysfunction, of the toxicity, then you continue to be in relationships like that because whatever you're carrying around on the inside is showing up in your outside world. It's reflective of your relationships. That doesn't mean their behavior is your fault. It just means you have to be aware of what you're exposing yourself to, what you're allowing, what you're being resilient to, and what you're not addressing inside of you. And for many years, I did not address the anger. I did not address my judgments. I didn't address my critical thoughts about other people's behavior. All I did was address their behavior. And so that's a good way to look at it is you see someone's behavior and you ask yourself, how do I feel about that behavior? And how can I change that feeling? How can I heal from how I feel about that behavior? Again, I'm not saying that you look at their behavior and you accept it. You may not be able to. It may be awful and you just can't be around it. But when you look inside and you ask yourself, well, what part of me? Well, why am I staying around someone that behaves like this? Knowing that this behavior is never going to change, then what is the next step for me? You start asking yourself those types of questions. They're very conclusionary. They're very final feeling. But when you finally address those questions inside of you and push yourself to the limit, because these questions are going to make you take a next step. And that's the scary part because taking the next step, that's the unknown. That's the abyss. When you do that, you're going to start thinking differently, probably for the first time ever. And especially if you've been focused on other people all your life for the first time ever, you're no longer focused on someone else. This is true self-empowerment. When you realize that your future is really shaped by you and not by waiting for someone else to change. I'm not saying that's the only way to look at it. There are exceptions to this, just like there are with every rule, but you're going to go a lot farther in life when you realize that there might be healing that needs to happen in yourself in order to get the results that you want in life, instead of getting into situations or relationships that never seem to work out. If you're always getting the things that don't seem to work out, then it's time to stop looking out in the world and start looking inside yourself and asking yourself important questions of what role you're playing and what you're holding on to that might be showing up in ways that you didn't even realize. There's a lot of introspection, a lot of self-reflection, and a lot of vulnerability because as soon as you start to do this, you might find out just how scary it is to take the spotlight off of other people, put it on you and take responsibility for your next step. Because so often we want the other person to be responsible for what's happening to us. It's a lot easier that way. I mean, it was for me. I'm, I won't speak for you, but it was for me for a long time to point my finger and say, that person is responsible for where I am today. That person is responsible for my anger. 
Not that other people can't make you angry. They absolutely can. But by continuing to be around that person and finally admitting that that person will never change, that puts me in charge of my own life. I want you to be in charge of your own life. Don't let your focus on someone else distract you from healing what needs to be healed inside of you. And the best way to tell what's going on inside of you is to remember the moments that you were emotionally triggered and something uncontrollable came out of you. That uncontrollable part is the deeper subconscious stuff that might need to be explored so that the next time you're triggered, what comes out of you is not a surprise because you know yourself so darn well. We'll be right back. Well, if you've been listening a while, I told you about two months ago that I got my first heart health test from Everlywell. It's the uh, amazing at-home wellness test that helps you better understand your health. And when I got the results, like I said, I was sitting in the waiting room at the hospital for a general checkup, and I was able to show my doctor the results as I walked in. And while I was there, I took another blood test just to match the results. I thought it would be cool since I'm there, Let's take a blood test at the hospital and match the results I got at Everly Well. And like I said, it was spot on. I mean, they were just so accurate. And that made me feel really good about the test, you know, because an at-home lab test, I, I'm not even familiar with that. I didn't even know that existed before Everly Well. And now that I do, it's going to save me so much time and money and just trips to the hospital when I need to get tests. And this is just one of the many tests they offer at Everly Well, and they have anything from tests on food sensitivities, fertility tests, um, heart health like I took, and more than 30 different other tests, including ones I didn't even know you could get tested for. I mean, I didn't know you could get a heavy metals test. That's pretty interesting. Are there any heavy metals in my blood? I, I want to know. So let's take a look. I want you to benefit from this too. Go to everlywell.com forward slash brain and enter the code brain to get 15% off an Everlywell at home lab test. It's sent right to your door. Your results come from certified labs and they're sent directly to your mobile phone and you can easily view and share them with your healthcare provider like I did. Each test has very easy to follow instructions and they're all physician reviewed and you're going to learn something about yourself that you might need to take action on. I mean, as soon as I got my heart health test back and I had elevated blood sugar levels, I realized where I needed to make changes in my life. And so, yes, I had to stop eating so many cookies and so many sweet things that our friends put on the table every time we go over. I have to watch my intake and I'm eating more salads. And, you know, these life changes I probably wouldn't have made had I not seen the practical results, and I think that's important to know what's going on on the inside so that you can take care of your life, take care of your health and well-being to help you feel better. So again, go to everlywell.com forward slash brain, enter the promo code brain to get 15% off an Everlywell at home lab test, everlywell.com forward slash brain, using the promo code brain during checkout. For listening to another episode of the overwhelmed brain i want to thank our sponsor everly well visit everlywell.com forward slash brain and use the promo code brain to get 15 percent off your home lab test and i want to thank the patron members supporting the show over at patron.theoverwhelmedbrain.com i appreciate you patron members anyone who's a patron member will get access to all the episodes that aren't in the public spotlight they aren't in the real world i should say and uh i don't think that's right but <laughs> there, there's also workbooks in there and discounts off products and services that i offer and uh anyone who's a patron member is supporting the show it is a way that we keep going over here and um you know you never hear me begging for donations i i don't do that i'm just thanking you if you 
find value in the show and you want to give back, that's the way to do it. Patron.TheOverwhelmedBrain.com And I also want to remind you of the Love and Abuse podcast. Every now and then I mention emotional abuse, well, probably more often than not, in my uh, Overwhelmed Brain podcast. Um, So I decided to create an entirely different podcast back in February of 2019 called Love and Abuse. And it covers the range of emotional abuse, control, manipulation, and other uh, variations that you've heard called psychological abuse, um, verbal abuse, and uh, basically it's a show about difficult relationships. Even if you think you're not in an emotionally abusive relationship, you're going to probably relate to a lot of the stuff that I talk about because there's somebody in your life that does behavior that you may want to learn more about just so you stay out of the muck and mire of manipulation, control, and especially emotional abuse. And I'm going to comment on that show in a moment because someone left me a scathing review, a not very good review for that show, which is unusual. I get so many good reviews for that show and also this show. So when the negative ones come in, it floors me. I'm like, whoa, what did I do? What did I say? What did I do wrong? And I think a lot of us can feel that way. When we get some sort of criticism or negativity, we think, oh no, what did I do? And I, th- I thought I was doing my best. I, I really thought I was helping people or I really thought I was doing it right. And suddenly someone puts you down. And so even people that work on their self-worth and self-esteem and think they have a grasp on their ego pretty well, uh, yes, I'm talking about myself and that does sound a little narcissistic, but (laughs) I think I have a grasp on a lot of what I teach and how I've healed throughout the years, but I'm also vulnerable. We're all vulnerable. We all have those moments where we think, ouch, that hurts. And so I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But again, let me remind you, Love and Abuse over at loveandabuse.com. It's a show that really dives into the nitty gritty of bad behavior or toxic behavior in relationships, relationships of all kinds. So check it out when you get a chance. And finally, I'd like to thank Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com for some of the music transitions in The Overwhelmed Brain. Like I said, I'm going to talk about when we get some criticism in our life and what do we do with it? How do we get out of the funky feeling that we get ourselves into. Somebody wrote that review, gave me one star for one episode of Love and Abuse, and they said, this guy doesn't know emotional abuse. He doesn't dive into it. The creators of this show should find someone who knows their stuff. And it's funny because I've been working with emotional abuse for many years now. I've been working with clients. I wrote a book on it. And it's interesting to get that kind of review from somebody who listened to one episode and decided they knew exactly who I was and how I was bad for the world. And so what I always do with negative reviews, and this is something that I think should apply anywhere in life, and I try to apply it everywhere in life, is when I get a negative review, when I get some sort of critical feedback, when I get anyone that puts me down, that calls me out, if they see something I'm doing that they don't appreciate or don't agree with, anytime that happens, I try to reach for that inner appreciation that someone's paying attention. That's hard to do because what ends up happening is you feel hurt. You can feel insulted. You can feel offended. When I get a negative review like that on something that I pour my heart and soul into and I try to spread a good message in the world, I don't charge for this message. I just put it out there and hopefully somebody gets something from it and when they don't that's okay too i mean they listen to the show and if they don't get anything from it then they go on to another show but when you put a lot of heart and soul into something that you believe in and you really have a desire to help and then someone comes along and stomps on that and says well you're doing it wrong or you're a bad person or you're giving bad information it throws you back and I honestly don't mind the critical reviews. In fact, I welcome them, especially when there's some validity to those. I don't think there was too much validity in this review. However, I always take a moment to absorb what they say. I check in with myself and absorb everything they're saying to make sure that my message is coming across in a healthy way, in a good way, and that I'm giving out good information. And quite frankly, after six, seven years of doing this show, 
it doesn't surprise me that I'll receive critical feedback every now and then. Because you can only do so much where you're going to disappoint someone, you're going to hurt someone's feelings, you're going to make someone upset at you because you can't please everyone. And there are going to be people in the world that have a different experience, that have different values, that have a different education, and they're going to look at what you're teaching, you're offering, you're giving, and see something wrong with it. These There are people out there that are going to see something wrong with what you're offering to the world or even in a conversation like one-on-one the other person might see you as bad or wrong or just plain stupid how does that feel when someone thinks you're stupid i mean that's that's like one of the worst for some people but where do you go when that happens where do you go inside when somebody criticizes you Like I said, the first place I go inside of me is an appreciation that someone's paying attention. And the second place I go inside of me is to reach for that thank you. That can be hard to do. But if you reach for the thank you and thank someone for not only paying attention, but providing you feedback, even if you disagree with it, that's the tough part. You might completely disagree. You might know that they're wrong. You might know 100% that they're wrong. But the fact that they took the time to express themselves and tell you what they thought, even though there could be some mean-spiritedness behind it. I'm not saying that's what happened here, but uh, I don't know. I don't know their intentions. But when someone is critical toward you and it seems like it's either mean-spirited or meant to hurt or offend you, I think it's helpful in you to remember what we were talking about earlier, those emotional triggers that come up, because your emotional trigger might say, what? I can't believe you said that about me. I've been trying hard. I've been doing my best. And to do our best to control that and reach for the appreciation that someone's paying attention. And you might think, well, it's great that they pay attention, but they don't have to say such mean things or hurtful things or critical things. Well, let me put it this way. If you go through your entire life with everyone complimenting you all the time or saying nothing at all, do you know where you can improve? Some say yes, some say no, some say that doesn't apply. I'm going to say it's harder to know where to improve and how to fine tune yourself when you get no critical feedback. If you get nothing negative, and it's always positive, always complimentary, it's not that you'll settle into complacency, although that could happen. It's that if you are unaware of how you come across to other people, again, even if those people are 100% wrong in your perception, it helps you fine-tune how you come across. Because I'm a firm believer that if I'm coming across in a way that hurts you, insults you, offends you, then I have a responsibility to be aware of how I'm coming across so I don't come across that way. There's no way to change who I am for everyone because that old saying, if you try to please everyone, you'll please no one. If you try to cater to everyone, you'll cater to no one. If you try to serve everyone, you'll serve no one. At least not in the capacity that makes a huge difference. You do your best to serve specific people, a number of people, whether that's one or 100 or 100,000, there are going to be people that resonate with you. There are going to be people that disagree with you. There are going to be people that see you as brilliant and there are going to be people that see you as the dumbest person on the earth. (laughs) Hopefully you don't know too many of those people and they're not in your life. But if they are, again, we come back to where do we go inside? And my go-to place, A, is appreciating they're paying attention. B, reaching for that thank you. Thank you for noticing that. Thank you for that information. Thank you for letting me know. You may not mean it, but I try to reach for that because it reminds me that I'm not infallible. It reminds me that as much as I try to perfect what I do on a daily basis, I will never be perfect I will never get it 100% right, and I should always strive to try harder. 
That doesn't mean I exhaust myself on a daily basis and become completely stressed about it. It's all about fine-tuning. Fine-tuning me. Still doesn't address the bad feelings, but it helps me on a practical level going forward. As for the bad feelings, my suggestion is something that I do. You don't have to have a website, but I have a website. And if I go to the overwhelmed brain and I look at my about area and see the praise for the overwhelmed brain page that I created, anytime someone compliments me, anytime someone sends me a good note or saying something, how much they love the show or how it saved their marriage, saved their life or any number of things that made their life better in some way or complimented me in some way or gave me positive feedback in some way, I put it on that page. And after I read this uh, review for Love and Abuse, I had to remind myself that I do bring value, that I do try as hard as I can to put myself out there, to be vulnerable, to show up in a way as transparent as I possibly can and wearing some very thin emotional armor because when you are transparent and when you are open, you are vulnerable. And so that emotional armor is very thin keeping yourself in that space day after day, it builds a mental resilience and it builds a mental strength so that when you're attacked or when you're insulted or when somebody just looks at you wrong and they get through that thin, thin layer of emotional armor because you're trying to be vulnerable, there is a chance that it will hurt more because there are people out there that wear a thick, thick layer of emotional armor so that no one can hurt them. I mean, you can see it in their face. No one's going to hurt me. I'm not going to let anyone pass this barrier that I'm putting up. And that's a tough way to live. It's hard to access the deeper emotional spaces that can be wonderful. At the same time, can also be painful. And if you never allow yourself to go into that vulnerable space where you are more open to people's criticisms then you could miss out on a lot of good things as well. And I'm not saying that you should just open yourself up and be transparent and vulnerable to everyone. You do this in small increments with people that you start to trust and you like and you know that they have your best interest in mind. And then you might have to wear a thicker emotional armor around people that don't have your best interest in mind. And so, yes, there's a give and take. There's a balance that you have to be aware of that you always have to continue looking at and making sure you're not too heavy on one side, not too light on the other, meaning you're letting the right people in. And every now and then, that critical feedback, that uh, hurtful comment, that insult, that remark, uh, someone's going to do something that can hurt. And so that third thing that I do is I go to that page where people have complimented me and praised me, and I reread many of the comments that people have made over the years to help remind me that there's so much good as opposed to the tiny bit of bad to remind me that I am worthy, that I am valuable, that I am important and not in an egotistical way, in a healing way. It's sometimes helpful to have something to refer to to remind you how amazing you are and how important you are and how valuable you are, let alone how wonderful you are and what a great personality you have. And even if you don't believe those things about yourself, there are times in your life where people have complimented you and made you feel on top of the world. Even when they complimented your hair or your clothes or the way you made them laugh, there's always something that we can look back and realize, hey, you know what? I am pretty darn lovable. I am pretty darn worthy. And you might have to write this stuff down like I did. You might have to put it in a notebook and refer to it every now and then because people are going to hurt you. There are going to be times in your life where you feel hurt. And besides working on your self-worth and self-esteem and self-love and self-compassion, besides that, even if you've almost mastered that, there are still times it's going to hurt. So this is why I like to reach for the positive stuff Not that I'm denying the negative. I mean, there's still healing that I need to do in there, but I can't let it overpower me. I can't let it overcome me to the point where all I can think about is that. So I need to counter it. You need to counter it. You need to counter the hurt. 
and having something to counter it with is a huge help. It can be a huge help. At least it works for me. And so that's what I want you to think about is when you get a compliment or when you've gotten uh, praised in the past, write this stuff down. I remember when I got praised at, for doing a great job. I remember when this person said that I was the funniest person they ever met. I remember and on and on and on. And every time it happens, make a note and refer to those notes. Because like I said, there can be hurtful people in the world. Some are intentional. Some are not. And the more you go through personal growth, the more you learn about vulnerability, the more you learn that vulnerability is a place of strength and power and access to more emotions and happiness and love and also pain because it's all kind of in the same pool down there. And being having access to the greatest emotions you can feel also gives you access to the most painful ones as well. And I'd hate to see you block the good stuff because you don't want to feel the bad stuff. Sometimes feeling the bad stuff might be necessary just to work on it, just to process it, just to heal it. And obviously when you feel something bad and you're emotionally triggered, there's probably something in there you need to work on anyway. And you don't want to deny that. You don't want to carry that around. Like I was saying earlier, if you carry it around and you're not working through it and you're not coming to a place in yourself that needs healing, and you work on that and whether that's talking with other people or meditating or talking to a coach or a therapist, whatever you need to do to work through that and run it by someone else or figure it out on your own, do the self-help thing. It's all valid. It's all good. And so are you. You are good. You are a good person. And sometimes it's hard to remember that because people come along and say, no, you're bad. No, you did this wrong. No, I don't believe you. No, I don't trust you. And all these things that can hurt and not feel good. And what do we do with that? We need a reminder. I mean, there are other processes and tools and techniques I've talked about in other episodes. Definitely listen to the other episodes where I talk about how you can strengthen your self-worth and self-esteem and build your confidence. Those are all valid as well. But I just want you to remember that the world is a grab bag full of people and some of them aren't going to be tactful. <laughs> some of them aren't going to be diplomatic. Some of them are going to be raw. And so how do we deal with that raw? We need to heal in ourselves and also remember that they are projecting to the world what they feel inside of them and what they think inside of them from their history, from their lifetime of experience. And that just because they said something about you that they don't like, it is a reflection of what's going on in them. And that can be a different experience than how you experience things. And so there is that. And that can help you come to an acceptance that just because someone said something about you, something that doesn't make you feel very good, doesn't even mean it's true. And it's easier to let go of things when you know in your heart that that wasn't true especially before they said it, because sometimes people have a tendency to try to convince us that something is true when it really isn't. Just like the critical feedback I got on love and abuse, what she said really wasn't true. <laughs> she said I had no experience. She said that I didn't know enough about emotional abuse. And all she did was listen to one episode that caused her or him to analyze my entire breadth of knowledge and experience in emotional abuse and probably didn't listen to any other episodes. And just like emotional abuse is hard to explain to others when you're going through it, it's also hard to cover every single aspect of it in one episode and expect everyone to get everything they need out of it. But I don't want to go into that too much. My advice is always listen for yourself. Judge for yourself. If you get the same feeling, then it's probably not for you. Or maybe there is something wrong and you need to call me out on it. I don't know, but I'm open to being wrong about anything. And that also helps. <laughs> it also helps to just allow myself to be wrong about things I believe I'm right about. That's a freeing place. Because if I say, hey, look, this is what I believe and this is what works. And you come along and say, no, this didn't work or this doesn't work. That's bad advice. I would say, okay, let's discuss it. That's a good topic to discuss. Let's see where we can go with it. Let's see if I had this wrong all along. That also keeps me out of an emotionally triggered space. And it's also humbling to make sure that I'm not too big for my britches. 
<laughs> so I want you to make up your own mind about things. I want you to follow a path that's right for you. And remember that people are going to be harsh sometimes. And when they are, just keep an open mind because this is where you step into your power. And this will help you be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. Always take steps to grow and evolve. You are powerful beyond measure. And above all, and this is something I absolutely know to be true about you, you are amazing. Amazing.